and we are going to continue our conversation about Lyme disease. Ali Hilfiger, who you just heard from, is going to come back up along with Heather Hurst, the founder of Project Lyme, and Dr. Holly Ahern, a microbiologist who's been studying Lyme for quite some time. So come on up, ladies. Let's give them a round of applause. So can you just, to, we heard a little bit about your Lyme story, and not a little bit, a lot of your Lyme <laughs> story. Uh, can, can you all briefly share your Lyme experiences? I'll start with you, Heather. Sure. So I actually had Lyme disease in 1986, uh, which is uh, pretty early on in the Lyme days. And I was 14 years old. I had um, symptoms throughout the summer, some of them very similar to Allie's. And, um, it was pretty bad. Um, I had the stiff neck, headaches, um, Bell's palsy, where the left side of my face was uh, paralyzed, a heart murmur. And you're a teenager. I was 14, yeah. So I didn't, although, you know, the symptoms came on over the summer where I was lethargic and, you know, having cognitive problems where I couldn't retain information, I didn't pay attention to it. I just thought, oh, I'll get better. So. It went on and on and on until I couldn't even get out of a beach chair and um, the face paralysis, heart murmur, no reflexes. But I was really fortunate in that um, I, my pediatrician knew what Lyme was and treated me immediately. So I am lucky to be alive. And Holly, you have a deep personal story with your daughter. Right. Um, my daughter went from quite literally being a college student. She was an all-star athlete. She had just come back from NCAA Swimming Nationals, where she had achieved All-American, wow. and called me up and said, I, I think I'm sick. I think I need to come home for the weekend. And so I went to get her, and she went to bed that night and basically didn't get up again for the next three months. Wow. So we had to, it was a fight to get her diagnosed, to get her treated. It was a fight with the insurance company to try to get some of it covered. And when it was all over with, I, and it isn't over with, I mean, she still has issues, but it, uh, along the way I said, you know what, this, I, we, I have to do something because uh, it, it's hurting too many people. And so, Ali, I'm gonna come back to you. Talk about how you finally got the correct diagnosis. I went to a, what's called a Lyme literate doctor. <laughs> and, um, you know, there are a lot of different strains of Lyme disease, and there are a lot of different ways to read the blood and the antibodies, and this particular doctor, along with many doctors after him, saw through the blood tests yep. and saw what was really going on. It was a sense of relief? I mean, I, literally, I felt like I won the lottery. Yeah. I really did. <laughs> you won the lottery, I have Lyme. I did, and I, I felt validated. Right. I felt like, you know, I, I'm not crazy. Yep. I, um, I'm not making these symptoms up. I mean, it was, it was, obviously very physically affected, right. but that the mental and emotional issues, I knew that wasn't me. Right. You know, I knew that was not me. So, so it was relieving. So let's talk about the state of Lyme today. Spreading rapidly. To me, it's a silent killer. What, why? What are the, why is it spreading so rapidly? What are some of the numbers? It's been here. It's, the awareness of it has been increased recently, but it has been here. So it seems like it's spreading rapidly, but it's because people are recognizing this as a problem. They are ordering the right kinds of tests. There's more diagnoses. There, historically, there have been a lot of people that have been affected, and, and one of the problems is if, unless the diagnosis is made early and treatment is early, the bacteria are able to disseminate through the body and then they develop biofilms and from that point on, it's very difficult to treat. In Allie's case, in Heather's case, my daughter's case, that was the problem. The biofilms were in, probably in your nervous system um, and it's well known that these bacteria can do that. 
So it used to be, you know, if you wanted lime, if you, if you wanted lime, if you didn't want lime, well, if you want lime, you can talk about that too. Uh, if, if you didn't want lime, you stayed away from certain areas. You, lime used to be somewhat restricted, I think, to the Northeast. You know, Hudson Valley, Connecticut, Lime, Connecticut. Uh, but now it's spreading, you know, it's popping up in other, other areas, California and so on. Do you think that's because uh, it's spreading or actually the diagnosis is getting better? I think it's both. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, recently spoke to a woman in California whose son was the first um, CDC reported Lyme case, and um, that was in 1992, and this is wow. Southern California. So, wow. you know, many people think that Lyme is not in California or just getting there, but apparently it's been there for a while. So, I do believe that, yes, it has been more heavily concentrated in the Northeast and down the East Coast and now the upper Midwest. But it's, I hear stories everywhere in California, and I know there's some counties in Alabama where it's endemic. It's, well, it's, it's everywhere. It's, 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 and it's in 50 states and it's 80 in, countries. Yeah, it's everywhere. But one of the things um, I learned recently was that the, our weather is warmer, so the ticks aren't yeah. dying. If the temperatures don't go below 40, if the, the ticks don't die if it's 40 degrees or above. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big issue. Yeah, the other... Um, the thing that I've heard and why the tick population is increasing and why there's more tick-borne disease is because there's more small mammals. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily because the predators of the, there's fewer of the predators or they're mm -hmm. not able to, you know, right. get, take care of the uh, smaller mammals. So we have more of them and they're the hosts of uh, the ticks. So they're moving the ticks all over. So. So you guys are in the thick of this. You're well educated on the subject, and and what's the, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. What's what's the biggest line myth that you'd like to clear up? That it's hard to catch and easy to treat. <laughs> yes. That is the biggest line myth that's mm -hmm. out there, and unfortunately, that's often the medical perspective on Lyme disease. Because for some people, if you if you are actually diagnosed early and treated early, that's true. But for other people, the disease can linger on and on. I mean, the the, the two examples here. And also with my daughter, and I would say that there are people in this room, if you ask them if they have Lyme disease or if they know somebody has Lyme disease, I will bet you that there are many people who will raise their hand. Mm -hmm. So. And so let's talk prevention. So in terms of avoiding it, so I've, I've shared this with you, Lyme disease scares the shit out of me. And <laughs> what I've done, and I've told you guys this, I've said to my wife, my wife says, let's go to the Hudson Valley. I'm like, no way. <laughs> like, the last thing, I have enough trouble, like, you know, I'm busy, the last thing I fucking want is Lyme disease. Like, we're just not going to go to the Hudson Valley, we're going to go to Miami. And now it's like, my wife's pregnant, we're like, we're not going to Miami, they got, you know, uh, got Zika there. So, and so, but that's not really a realistic way to live. Um, you know, so what do you say to people um, in terms of prevention? Or maybe we'll start, we'll have fun with it. What do you, if I want to get Lyme disease, what should I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, there are, are, listen, I have a one and a half year old daughter. Yep. And I don't live in fear and I don't put her into some bubble. Yep. But I live as an educated mother. I spray her down with insect repellent, either organic or or regular, whatever floats your boat, long light clothes, tucking the, so the pants into the mm -hmm. socks, doing tick checks. I mean, all this information is on Heather's uh, website. So projectline.org, Project yeah, the many options for and, 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 tick and prevention. And tell them your, your whole list of... My list of yeah, all of them? What are the, what are <laughs> you don't want all things? of them. What are the, what are the five kids? things? Oh, five. Well, <laughs> let me just organize it a little differently. So the first thing is to know where ticks live, where yep. they're most prevalent. And that is ticks like dark, humid areas in the woods. And they like, like a leaf litter and wet logs and just grass and sand dunes are, you know, particularly, sand yeah. Yeah, long, the blades of the grass. Deck, so grass. walking to the beach can actually be um, dangerous. So <laughs> it's important to uh, stay in the center of trails. So knowing where ticks live. So don't roll around naked in the leaves. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> the wet no, leaves. And yeah, so uh, staying on the center of the trails. So knowing where ticks live and then preparing like some of the things that um, Ali said about before you go outside. So 
you can dress to protect yourself. So covering up, wearing light colored clothing so you can see the ticks, wearing clothing that is treated with permethrin. Mm -hmm. Either you can spray your own clothes with permethrin or you can purchase clothes that um, have insect shield technology and that's odorless. It's, um, I think, safer than deep because it's not on your skin, it's on the fabric and it also works with mosquitoes. So um, that's very helpful. And then once you're outside, being aware of your surroundings and staying on the trails and everything I just said. But also when you come back inside, if you know you've been in an area where it's a high risk for ticks, I would recommend putting your clothes in the dryer on high heat. They do not like um, dry heat. So, we're in good shape in Arizona. Yeah, we're in pretty good shape, although I have heard some interesting yeah. stories recently in Arizona. But, They're huh. here. They're here. So really? um, yeah. that is good. Taking a it's shower. Like, it's like E.T. Yes. <laughs> I know, these guys. ticks yeah. are uh, they're, they're getting around. Taking a shower after being outside and washing off um, any unattached ticks and checking yourself at that time is really good. Um, but... The number one thing, I think, is um, doing tick checks and making that a part of your daily routine. And children are at highest risk, and so... So why is that? Because they're little? I think that they're just, they're, you know, like running around in right. the grass, playing outside. Um, I think that's it. They're, they're just, just enjoying the outdoors. They're more right. uninhibited. Yeah. And ticks from the ground, too. Ticks come from the ground right. up, typically, so... Um, you know, spraying your shoes with permethrin and socks is really good. But the what, the what I wanted to say is that, you know, making Tic Tacs a part of your daily routine, especially with your children, is really yeah. important. And what I do is I have a 7 and an almost 10-year-old, and every night at bedtime, we make it part of our bedtime routine. So the kids go upstairs to brush their teeth, and they get naked, and as they're brushing their teeth, my husband and I check them. We, you know, look in every single nook and cranny, and th when I say nook and cranny, I mean like the groin area, armpits, behind the right. knees, and then, you know, hair, and um, we do that every night, and we're at a point where my kids actually remind me, Mom, don't forget to do my tick pack. I want to get my pajamas on. So, you know, it works. Like, yep. it's, it's just like do you brushing your teeth. Do you make it sexy with your husband? Sure, tick sure. Tick checks like, can be like, sexy. Kind of... Like, oh, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, <laughs> so what, do you, what do you do if you think you have it? So let's say you're doing a tick check and you think, okay, I think I got bit. What do you do immediately? I'm going to hand this one off to you guys. So if you think you have been bit or you have to remove a tick? Let's do both. Okay, so remove the tick as fast as possible because... Care carefully. Carefully. So you need to use fine tip tweezers. Yep. And you want to get as close to the skin as possible yep. and pull straight up. And they're real, just if anyone's, well, I don't know if anyone's removed a tick here, but they're, they're pretty stuck in there. They like cement their way, they cement in. So it's, you really gotta pull hard. And another thing is that you don't feel a tick bite. They are, um, they have magical powers and they, um, they anesthetize, anesthetize um, as they go in so you don't feel it. So removing a tick as fast as possible because the, you the, Tick, uh, the Lyme transmission will, you know, happen within 24 hours. Wow. And other tick-borne diseases to transmit even faster. Um, another recommendation that I have is to save the tick so you can send it in for testing to see mm -hmm. if the tick is um, carrying any um, disease. So putting it in a bag with a little bit of moisture. like a So piece of extract the tick, extract put it in the, a bag, go to a doctor. It. Or town yeah. hall. Or it, Town hall, oh, yeah. you can go to, right? I don't know. Please. Some town halls, maybe, but I, there's tickreport.com is a good place to uh, send your ticks in. And what do you do if you go to your doctor? So you, you have a tick, you bring the tick in, you go to your doctor, and what if, what if your doctor's not educated? That's what do you, what do you push your doctor? Problem. That's right. a, yeah, that's a That is a major problem. problem. Um, because the conventional approach to Lyme disease is that, well, you know, there has, the tick has to be attached for 36 to 48 hours, the science has pretty much proven that to not be correct, that transmission of the microbes inside of ticks, and it's, you know, it's more than just Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a disease caused by one single bacterial species, but 
there are multiple species of the same bacteria that cause similar symptoms that the blood tests don't detect. Mm. There are other microbes inside those ticks. And you will go to your doctor and you'll have a tick bite. And the approach has historically been wait and watch to see if a bullseye rash appears. Yep. If it doesn't, you're safe. And that the research also shows that less than 10% of people actually get a bullseye rash when the, to, as an indicator of Lyme disease. Less than 10%. 50% of people don't get any rash at all at the site of the I tick bite. I didn't get a rash. My I daughter didn't get did a rash. not get a rash either. <laughs> wow. So, so that three is, of us that is are three stories. No And so don't bullseye. wait for the rash. Don't wait for the rash. And so what's next? Do most doctors just they either dismiss you or maybe prescribe doxycycline? Or what's, what's usually the protocol? And what should you push for? If you go in there and the doctor, what do you do next if your doctor sort of blows you off? Go to a different doctor. Go to a yes. different doctor. <laughs> yeah. or, or you could actually educate the physician by bringing in articles or by bringing in uh, references that show that the bacteria can be transmitted, that the bullseye rash is a myth. That, and you can ask, right. you can advocate for treatment of the tick bite. Sure. Which, you know, everybody, uh, the one thing that everybody with Lyme disease seems to agree with, or in, in Lyme disease seems to agree with, is that the sooner you catch it, the sooner you diagnose it, the sooner you treat it, the better yeah. the outcome. Well, I want to jump to treatment. So something we talk a lot, of, a lot about here is Eastern and Western, and Lyme is the perfect example of that. So, you know, there's a Western approach, antibiotics, mm -hmm. doxycycline, but there's also the Eastern approach, you know, things like bee venom. And, and talk about what, what are some of the treatments that have worked, what, what's promising, what, what do you think the future holds in terms of treatments for Lyme? The historical <laughs> treatment has been antibiotics. And yep. I have to tell you that from the very first earliest clinical studies of antibiotic treatment with Lyme disease, what those studies show is that roughly 50% of people continue to have symptoms of Lyme disease. And whether they call it Lyme disease or not, because many physicians will say that it's a, a post-Lyme syndrome or it's related to something else, the fact is these people remain sick. And so it's not the early Lyme the 50% that recover with early antibiotics, because that's the same as treating any bacterial infection. Really, mm -hmm. you take short-term antibiotics. It's what happens to those patients after, and what is the role of antibiotics, because as a microbiologist, antibiotics are the equivalent of chemotherapy for cancer patients. They do m massive damage, as you heard Dr. Perlmutter sure. say earlier, they do massive damage to the microbiome. So, but what do you do? What is the role for antibiotics? And I think that's where research has been lacking, and. The good news is, you know, 30 years too late, um, the yep. research is starting now to investigate other approaches. So. Can you talk a little bit about the promising holistic alternatives that have worked for some people? Right. Well, these guys are experts on that, right? I am not an expert on the uh, treatments for holistic. I'll you, I'll let you take that. Uh, listen, I, I did antibiotics for a long time. Listen, yep. if I had gone on antibiotics right when my mom found the tick, then I probably wouldn't have suffered as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I might have continued with things, but who knows? Actually, really, who knows? When I switched over to alternative treatment, they detoxed my body first. And mm -hmm. I was on like a three-month, really intense detox program with vitamins, very yep. strict, clean diet, colonics, massages, detox, homeopathic IVs, homeopathic drops. And... Uh, so the, the detoxification process was really crucial in order to build up the immune system. Mm -hmm. So once that was done, then they went in and boosted the immune system. Yep. And that seemed to really do a lot of, a lot of good for my body. So listen, everybody's body is very different. Right. There's really like no one proven method, unfortunately, because yep. everybody's immune systems are different, because there are so many different strains yep. of bacterium with the Lyme disease. Um, and we're, we're still finding out different methods. I mean, something that works for you might not sure. work for me. I did an, an India, uh, Indian Ayurvedic medicine mm -hmm. and did panchakarmas, and it worked really well for me. I did solar return meditations where I visualized myself going to every single person that I knew in my life, telling them that I was healed. Mm -hmm. I did visualization practices, visualizing, my, visualizing myself completely, perfectly healthy and healed. You know, putting white light into every single cell in my body, mm -hmm. imagining every spirochete bacterium dissipated, the right. biofilm dissipa dissipated. Right. That, along with other treatments, I think right. really help. Holly, can you talk a little bit about what seemed to work, work well with your daughter? 
Continuing on the theme of uh, anti-inflammatory diets, mm -hmm. um, because really the underlying pathology for the long-term Lyme symptoms is chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. So this is another one of those chronic inflammatory diseases. So the first thing was to remove every type of inflammatory thing that entered her body, and mm -hmm. um, practice she still continues to this day. And then the other thing that actually worked for her was to use um, pulsed electric field, um, mm. a device called a Rife machine. Oh, yeah. Yep, and that actually, I think, was what put her Can over there. Can you talk about that as well? Yeah, because it turns out that, you know, I'm a scientist, and so you hear from people who say, yeah, there's this crazy device that you sit in front of, and it bombards you with radiation, and you're going to be fine. <laughs> to which you say, yeah, right, you are. So what I wanted to do before I did anything with that um, was to test it in my laboratory. So I actually have done experiments using pulse electric fields with Anthony Holland at Skidmore College, wow. um, which, you know, basically what I was able to show is that using certain frequencies of sound waves, these are sound waves, does actually dissipate the biofilm of Borrelia, mm -hmm. the bacterial biofilm that forms. This is all in vitro, meaning in test tube type experiments. And then I also switched it over when I, the results were very interesting. I tested it against two other bacteria. One was Pseudomonas, which is a notorious biofilm producer, chronic disease inducing type of bacteria. Mm -hmm. And the other was MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. These are oh. antibiotic resistant bacteria. And the results were amazing to me because I, I can kill antibiotic resistant bacteria yeah. with this. It, not just the frequencies, but also in low levels of antibiotics. So that was good enough for me, and I said, she's going to do this because it's right. not damaging, so we're going to try it, and I, it made a huge sure. difference. What about ozone therapy? Yep, there's ozone therapy, there's hydrogen like peroxide. Bee venom. That, what's that? Bee venom, I've Bee heard. Bee venom, yeah. yep. I, know, I actually know people, people have reached out to me that have tried all of those things, and some things work for some people, and right. other things work for other people, and it is very much an individual process. Sure. Yeah. So for everyone watching, uh, to close the loop, a lot of people affected by Lyme disease, personally, their loved ones, if, there, if there's a message to share with those people who Lyme is affecting their lives, what's that message? Don't give up. <laughs> there is hope, and there, you know, I'm in touch with uh, many people in the Lyme world doing amazing research, and yes. I really believe we're finally coming to a place where we're gonna have better treatment and better tests, mm -hmm. and um, I, 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 it's, it's gonna happen. It, it's the tipping point, as we like mm -hmm. to say. But in the meantime, since we don't have good testing and right. we don't have good treatment for later stage Lyme, you really need to educate yourself yep. and be your own advocate, and do your tick checks. Just make it a part of your daily routine. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, guys. And check out projectlime.org. Thank so you. So you don't get Lyme. <laughs> so thank you so much, guys. It was thank excellent. You. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. That was great.